Roger Martin sees too many corporations whose single solitary purpose is to maximize shareholder value, sometimes to the detriment of society. But he has hope. Joining us now to discuss how we can, quote, fix the game and restore stability to our economy, here is Roger Martin, author of Fixing the Game, Bubbles, Crashes, and What Capitalism Can Learn from the NFL. That's kind of odd for a head of a Rotman School of Management or former to be you know, writing a book with the NFL in the title, but we'll get to that in a bit. Welcome, first of all. It's great to have you back here at TVO. It's fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Before we do talk about the book, though, I do want to talk about your departure from Rotman, which came a year earlier than you were signed on to. Mm -hmm. Now, you had a good run. 15 years is a good run. Yeah. But you left a year early. How come? You know, I, I started thinking last fall, so with about 18 months or so left in the term I could have had, is this good for the school to have uh, me here and not be able to do anything really long term without imposing that on the next dean? Uh, and one thing that the previous dean to me never did was sort of impose half-finished plans on me. And so I sort of said to myself, I either have to not do anything new and big for, for 18 months uh, and then leave the new dean with a nice sort of clean slate to do whatever he or she wants, or start things, start, start big, important things uh, in, that, in that period, and then stick the new dean with that. And, and I came to the conclusion that what would be best for the school, totally for the school, would be for me to step down nine months from then, which, which, which was uh, June 30th, uh, uh, instead of about 18 or 20 months uh, from then. And, and I, I think it was the, the right choice. And uh, when you told them that, what was their reaction? Well, a, a lot of it was, why don't you stay the extra year? Uh, but I, I, I honestly, you know, I'm, I, I was the leader of the place, and I felt it was my responsibility to do what I thought was best for the school. And I think the school will be much better off having a new dean uh, sooner. Because everything, everything good we did at the Rotman School in the last 15 years took between five and ten years to accomplish. If I look at the major things we, that we did, like build, build a new uh, uh, building, uh, uh, take the faculty from being a good Canadian-only faculty to a really global faculty, to expand it, uh, to triple the size of the, the, the program, all of those things took big chunks of time. And the sooner the next dean can be in place to do you know, five or seven year things, the, the better. That was my, that was my thought. Okay. And, I th and I think I was right. <laughs> <laughs> What's this thing called the uh, Martin Prosperity Institute? First of all, who'd they name it after? Well, they named it after my parents, uh, Lloyd and Delphine Martin. And it was Joe Rotman, beloved Joe Rotman, who's, who couldn't possibly be a better benefactor uh, to sort of say thank you to me for the first term when I was signing up for my second term. As, as dean, he uh, gave a wonderful gift of $10 million to set up a research institute uh, that was something that he was really interested in, applying sort of uh, management principles more broadly to the economy. Uh, and he was very clear. He just said, Roger, uh, I'm going to give the school $10 million for this if it's named Martin, and I'm not if it's not. Because he <laughs> knew my inclination would be to say, no, 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 Joe, you don't name it, name it after me. And so the compromise was it's uh, named after my beloved uh, parents, my dad, who's, who's still with us, and my mom, who uh, passed away last year. How old's your dad? He is uh, 83. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's in, he's in really good health. Thank you for asking. Good. What are your plans for the Martin Prosperity Institute? Uh, to study the future of democratic capitalism. Um, I love democracy and I love capitalism, uh, but I would say that it is not performing in ways that everybody who loves democracy and capitalism ha hopes for it. And the, and the big thing that I'm, I'm, I probably am worried about more than anything else is that for so long, democratic capitalism, as practiced in the West and particularly North America, uh, produced a uh, consistently rising median income uh, in, in uh, society. And so the, the truly average person, the median person, could always believe that if they worked hard and saved and invested, et cetera, they would move ahead. In the last 20 or so years, that stopped. Uh, and, and if you want the combination of democracy and capitalism, that's a problem. If all you care about is capitalism, you, you can have it, you can have state capitalism, and the 51st per percentile person doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you want 
democratic capitalism, that 51st percentile person has to vote for the system. Uh, and I think you're in danger every time that 51st percentile person says, you know, I'm not sure I like this. The other thing is I, you know, I, I also care about is the, is the 10th percentile or the 5th percentile being helped out by society. I actually think we're still doing that, but I'm not sure their prospects are as good either if all the, econo or the vast majority of the economic growth and prosperity is going to the top 1% or, or even top one-tenths of 1%. Not enough is going to make sure everybody's vote is lifted so that when they go to the ballot box, they say, this is working. This is, this is working uh, uh, for us. And so I want to study, are there ways that we can make sure that democratic capitalism is tweaked in ways that are required for the 21st century. I don't know what those ways are. That's mm. that's the, that's what I've uh, just embarked just embarked on uh, doing as of July one, uh, and uh, uh, so that's what MPI is going to be up to. It, it certainly feels, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it certainly feels like there is an all-time lack of faith in both democracy and capitalism right now at this moment in our history, and. I don't know how far back we ought to go to find out where that train started to go off the tracks, but just for argument's sake, let's take the dot-com bubble burst of, uh, I guess, the late 90s. As we look back on that today, and if that is, in fact, the starting point, who do we get to blame? Well, it's, I, I think it's not a bad uh, starting point. I mean, I mean, it's interesting. I almost think that the hubris was the first starting point. Uh, F uh, Francis Fukuyama, who's a favorite author of mine, he's a terrific uh, guy, wrote this article in 1989 called The End of History, where he said, the story of human history is the, is the battle between democratic forms of, of, uh, of organization and totalitarian ones. And democracy is one, it's over, history is, history is done. And I feel that that was an expression of hu hubris, because 10 years later, after writing that, kablam, the, the dot-com, bubble and burst, and everybody started asking uh, the questions, why, why did democracy and democratic capitalism produce such a, such a cataclysmic crash? And so, so I, I, think you're, I think you're right, and, and I think in particular when we did all sorts of things after it to fix it up, and then only seven years until the next cataclysmic uh, crash in 2008 or seven or eight years, I think that's really uh, under, undermined undermined people's faith in, in democratic capitalism very deeply. Your memory on this is probably better than mine, but if I recall the Fukuyama article, it was called the end of history, but there was a question mark at the end of that word, yes. line, wasn't there? Yes, there was. So he wasn't saying this is the end of history, but he was asking the question whether or not democracy had in fact won, yes. and therefore let's move on. No, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay. It, it was slightly less hubristic, but I, <laughs> but, uh, but I look back at that and, and, and say maybe that, maybe that was the start and then, then the big event is exactly, is that exactly as you uh, cited. So who, hubris gets the blame for the dot-com crash, for starters <laughs> anyway, but then there were allegedly a bunch of fixes put in to make sure that wouldn't happen again. What were the fixes that people felt so confident about at that time? Well, there was a real sense that, uh, that stock options uh, were, were, had been a big problem. So there were all of these dot-com firms out on, the, out on the West Coast that were handing out uh, uh, stock options uh, like crazy uh, as the form of compensation, and uh, which had become, over the, over the previous decade, you know, so sort of stock-based compensation had become the norm, whereas before it hadn't been. And the, and the view became, aha, the problem here is that when you give these executives stock, base, uh, um, stock options, they have a huge incentive to kind of, as, as in baseball terms, swing for the fences, mm -hmm. try and hit the home run. If they strike out, hey, they have no real, they have no downside. Still get a uh, golden parachute. They get a golden parachute, that's right. And their options, which they were given at market value, they, they, they have no lower value uh, uh, than that. Uh, but if you hit the home run, you get massively rich. And so the fix, a important fix that was put in place was, oh, stock op options that used to be good are bad. We should give, we should give sort of shadow stock, deferred stock units or restricted stock units as they're, as they're called. That was one. And then the other one was, oh, we don't have enough independence in the audit committee, so we have to have more independent uh, people on, uh, on audit committees. 
so those were, it was sort of like, well, the right people aren't paying attention and they have the wrong incentives and so we'll, we'll change the form of stock-based compensation and we'll still believe that boards and audit committees can do their job, but if we jostle the, the uh, composition of them a little bit, uh, everything will be fine. And why didn't that do the trick? I don't, I think it didn't do the trick because, because stock-based compensation overall is a, is a crummy thing. Uh, I, I don't think it has the effect that we believe, or that many people, not me, <laughs> believe that it has. Uh, and in fact, it has the opposite effect. So people are of the general belief, the world is still of the general belief that stock-based compensation aligns the interests of management with shareholders. So management will do things that are, are naturally good for shareholders. And the theory is simple, right? It's pretty simple. It's, oh, if I give you some stock, you know, Steve, if I give you stock-based compensation and the stock's at, you know, 50 bucks uh, now and you're the CEO, if you could make it go up to 100 bucks, guess what? The shareholders will be better off and you'll be better off. Da-da, that's, uh, you know, that's it. Win-win. Win-win. And, and, it, and it turns out that it just doesn't, doesn't take into account uh, some, some important things. So one of the examples I always, I always give is, is, the, is this terrible meltdown of, of 2008. And so I say if you had two CEOs uh, and, they, uh, and they both take over uh, publicly, publicly traded companies, let's say in the U U.S., January 1, 19, uh, 2007, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they both stay for five years and retire uh, December 31st, 2011. Uh, so what happens to the, to, the, to the stock market during that, that period is it goes up to its all-time high in the fall of 2007, and then in 2008 craters and gets down to 45% of, of its initial value in the spring of uh, uh, 2009, and then slowly works its way back up to about 88% of the previous uh, uh, high, uh, the January 1 level by the end of their five years. So you say that's, that's what happened in the stock market. And if you had two CEOs and one uh, CEO managed his company to exactly parallel the market. So it goes up about 15%, then plummets down to 45% of its, its value, huge plummet, then works its way up to 88%. And then you have another CEO who manages uh, the company to be completely flat. For some reason or another, the stock starts at 100 and ends up at 100. So he saves you all this roller coaster ride and ends up 12% higher at the end on retirement. So the question is, which CEO, uh, the one that whose stock went up and down and ended up 12% lower than, than uh, started with, or the one who saved the investors from that and it ended up 12% ended up higher? Who made more money? The answer is, the wildly swinging one who ended up costing the shareholders 12%. That CEO made more money. Made more money, uh, yeah. And the reason is he got either deferred stock units or stock options when the stock was low because it got all the way down hmm. to 45% of its initial uh, value. So then when it went back up. And then it went back up, he makes a bunch hmm. of money. The other person just makes n makes no money, has no appreciation because the stock stays the same. And his company's worth more at the end of the day. 12% more. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Perverse incentives. Yeah. And, and, and the people who, who sort of created this notion of alignment just didn't understand that it isn't really uh, uh, alignment. It's, it is actually an incentive for, for companies to manipulate expectations, not real performance. Um, so, in fact, I would argue that the biggest uh, incentive it is to give somebody stock-based compensation is for them to, uh, uh, for a CEO to come in and immediately declare, and you'll recognize this because you interview lots of business people and whatever, how many times does a new CEO come in and say, oh my goodness gracious, it's so much worse than I thought. <laughs> Now that I'm inside, politicians I've seen, do the same thing. Yes, they do. It's funny Cupboard's how they work. Cupboards bare. Yes. Cupboards bare. Yes. We had no idea. No, exactly. <laughs> CEOs do that all the time, and so then what happens? The stock plummets. Uh, they get some more stock options the next the the, the next year or stock based compensation. They announce huge cuts or something to restore. It. They work it back up to maybe the same level as when they started, and shareholders have made nothing. 
and the CEO has made a ton. Okay, but there are people there. <laughs> th th there are supposed to be people mm -hmm. who make the rules of this game, mm -hmm. who can see the perversity in all of what you've just described, and presumably want to put an end to that. Why isn't that happening? Uh, because they're mainly averting their eyes to it. They, they, I mean, this is one of these things where it's so ingrained now, this notion that it is alignment, that they're all saying, well, maybe it's little nuances. We maybe have, maybe we have to make them for longer vesting periods, or or maybe more, you know, s uh, deferred stock units instead of stock options. They're not asking the fundamental question, which is, is the fundamental design of this just plain wrong? And that's where that, that's where my argument is. My argument is, is that is that when when you are given a, a, a stock at a given value, the only way that you can make it worth more is to, is to raise expectations about future performance. Right? That's what a stock is. So if, if, if you think about it, uh, a stock is what everybody out in the, in the potential stock buying market thinks is going to happen in the future. Right? Uh, and, they, and they say, based on what we think, this is what it's going to be worth. Uh, and once they think it's going to be worth a whole lot, uh, uh, it's hard for any company to do better. So I often give the, a drug example, a drug company example. So let's say one of the big pharma companies, let's say Pfizer, the CEO comes to the, comes to, uh, gives a press conference and says, I have great news for all of you. We have just invented the cure for all cancer. And it's this little pill, uh, and all you do is you take it and it cures all cancer. So what would happen to the stock the next day, the value, right? Whew. So maybe it's 200 billion now, it would go to, let's say, 5 trillion, because they can solve all cancer with a little pill that costs nothing to, nothing, uh, to produce now that they've done all the R&D. So fast forward to six months later, the stock is now trading at a $5 trillion level, and somebody stands up at the shareholders meeting and says, Mr. President, uh, we're kind of disappointed in the, uh, in the stock. It hasn't done anything in the last nine months. And the CEO says, what do you mean? We <laughs> cured cancer. And the person says, yes, but I, I bought the stock after you made that announcement, and you haven't done anything, anything yet. Hasn't Nothing. moved up since then. Yeah, it hasn't moved up. In fact, it, it's just been off 10%. And so <laughs> I think we should get rid of you because you suck. <laughs> all right? so, That's the world they live in. Yeah. So it's all about expectations of future performance and changes in expectations of future performance, not real performance, not solving real problems for real consumers and getting more more consumers, and that's the flaw. The flaw is st a stock-based compensation is an incentive to manipulate expectations. It is not an incentive to increase the underlying performance of the company in serving real customers. Well, let me come back to something I suggested at the very top of our conversation here, which is the reference to the NFL <laughs> yes. in your business book. Um, you know, the NFL is, a, they're all stinking rich and they're all communists. It's an incredible <laughs> system, right? They've got an amazing system, these that owners. True. What do we learn from the NFL in terms of uh, managing uh, a real business and the expectations of markets and making a profit and yet living as communists? Right. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a, there's lot a lot of, in there. There's but, a lot of stuff going on yeah, there, Steve. There's a lot in there. <laughs> well, uh, why I think the NFL is kind of a cool uh, thing to talk about as, a, as an analogy to business is, as you can argue in, in business, there's a, a real market, you know, building real factories to produce real products to sell to real customers and earn a real profit. And then this expectations market, the stock market where people look and imagine what's going to happen in the future and on the basis of that, uh, uh, there is a stock price uh, created and that's a creature of expectations. It turns out in football, NFL football, it's remarkably similar. There's a real game that's played on a real field where two real teams play for 60 real minutes and have real runs and real throws and real touchdowns and real field goals, and there's a real winner and a real loser. Associated with that is a, a game that some people think, the estimates are it's bigger than in dollar value to the real game, which is the game called betting on NFL football. <laughs> And what happens there is, is if Steve, you're better, you you think between uh, between Monday and Saturday what's going to happen on Sunday, and on the basis of what you think your expectations of what will happen on Sunday, you bet. And those friendly bookies in Las Vegas establish a point spread, which says if if Steve is betting on the favorite, um, he's going to have to give points. 
his team is going to have to win by, let's say, four points. Uh, it's not enough uh, to win. More. You got to win, win by, by X by, amount. By X amount, because they need Roger to take the other side of the bet and bet on the other team, which is the underdog. And the good news is, I get four, uh, four points if my team wins or loses by four points or less. I win. Mm -hmm. That dynamically changes all the way th uh, through the week, right up to the, the, the time of the game, just like a stock price uh, ch uh, changes. And so there's an expectations game and a real game in football as well. But in football, they treat those two games so differently. And you know what the answer is. What, 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 you know, you're a quarterback of, uh, I don't know, whatever. You're, you're, you replace Peyton Manning as quarterback of the Den Denver Broncos, and you decide you'd like to bet on, on one of your games. What happens to you? You're out for life. Yes, yes. <laughs> How many strikes? One, and, and you're out. Yeah. So they have this strict separation, mm -hmm. absolutely strict separation, back from Pete Rozelle, back all the way to 1961, uh, strict separation between the real game and the expectations game, because if you're the quarterback of the De Denver Broncos, we do not want you thinking about what's the point spread, and can I, do I have to take some risky actions at the end? I'm winning by, by four, but I'm favored by 10. Uh, and so in, in order to win uh, against the spread, I have to throw a long bomb down the field, uh, uh, gets picked off, goes the other way, and, uh, and suddenly I'm actually losing the real, real game. We don't want any of that because it'll wreck the fan experience. It'll wreck the game. But they understand that there's two different games going on here. Yes. The real economy doesn't. The, it doesn't seem to. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing that sort of fascinates me, and that's why I use the analogy to say, boy, the analogy is it, you know, analogies are analogies, and not exactly perfect, but it's pretty darn uh, uh, kind of apt. And what is it that causes the NFL to be so doctrinaire? I mean, any one one strike and you're out versus CEO. So if you're a quarterback, one strike and you're out, you don't go close to the expectations game or else. Mm -hmm. If you're a CEO, you have to play. Like, we're not going to hire you unless you take a stock-laden uh, uh, package and, and even directors. Directors typically have to accumulate stock in the company of, of X times their annual director's fees. It's not optional. It's mandatory. So it's, it's forbidden and it's mandatory. For me, it's sort of, well, doesn't that tell you something? Hmm. I was only being half facetious when I called them all <laughs> communists before, but... <laughs> But I guess I should explain. You know, yeah. it, th this is a kind of a game where they've all, all these capitalists, made their money being aggressive, rapacious, doing whatever they did in the, yeah. in, the, in the real economy. And then they come together in this thing called the NFL, where regardless if you work in New York or Green Bay, you split the profits evenly. Yeah. And everybody makes the same as everybody else. Yeah. That is a, I mean, that's a genius who was able to convince all of these different capitalists to do business that way. But would you recommend that kind of idea for the real economy as well? Uh, yes and no. So I, I think the idea that, that the, the real economy uh, needs rules, right? Uh, I like the sort of expression, you know, the, the laws of the, uh, the land are there to set you free. In some sense, if you don't have any rules, uh, you get you get anarchy in almost in almost any field, and and so I think to me what the NFL shows is that in that particular context, sort of more care about the rules than than less makes sense. And what they've figured out is that maintaining a certain kind of competition, a sort that allows uh, allows Green Bay to actually actually compete, not not like baseball where the Yankees have twice as much money as everybody to spend every year, and and. Uh, you know, uh, that has its consequences. I wouldn't follow each of those rules and say that particular rule deserves to be in the economy. But what I like about the NFL is that the NFL understands those rules incredibly carefully uh, or thoroughly, and every year they tweak them. So every year there's a thing called the competition committee that's made up of owners and, and managers, coaches and players that looks at game film for days on end and says, how do we have to tweak the game, the rules of the game, so that it, is, it provides a great experience for the fans? And, and if, you, if you look at it, there have been so many tweaks, you know, if you're a real football geek, I guess, like, like <laughs> I am, you know, you move the, the hash marks toward the center or away from the center. You kick off from a different place. You know, the offensive linemen can do this. Defensive backs can do that. But let, me, let me jump in here because we've yep. got about a minute to go here, <laughs> and, and I want to get your view on this. 
there are owners who still try to game the system, meaning that we have a league-wide contract with Adidas, yes. but my team's going to sign a deal with Reebok, and I'm going to pocket all that extra money. So even in this perfect system, if you like, um, where they know it works because it's the most profitable bloody sports league in the world, the owners are still trying to game and cheat. They, maybe you can't. Maybe you can't take this out of a capitalist's DNA. Is that possible? No, I think it. I think it's not only possible, but it's right. And that's why I say you have to keep tweaking. You'll never get it right, in the sense of I've, I've finished. I'm done. People will always try to game the game, mm -hmm. and it's and you've got to just say that'll happen, and then we've got we've got to step in and and change, uh, and alter the rules. And I think that's. That's the secret. Like I think in capital markets right now, we have these big, gigantic things like Basel III and the like, and, and Sarbanes Oxley and, and Frank Dodd, and they're these gigantic legislative packages that take 10 years to get through, and everybody hopes that was so painful, we'll never have to do that again. Completely wrong. We should be taking tiny little slices, if we like Dodd Frank, tiny little slices, putting them through, seeing how they work, tweak, 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 tweak. And I think we need to change that we, we still sort of have a very industrial view of setting rules. We set them once, and that's the way they are. And I think in the modern economy, you gotta just do gotta, the NFL. Yeah, tweet, gotta do tweet, 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 tweet. You have set the table for the discussion that will come again tomorrow, because we're not done with you yet, Roger Martin. Thank you for coming here today, and we'll continue our conversation tomorrow. Roger Martin will join us again tomorrow night. We hope you can too. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.